Oh God, I think I think I'd have a Brad Pitt situation. I'd have the uh, oh God, uh, uh, and then the gun. Is that an orgasm? And yeah, just yeah, exactly. Remember when we first met John McClane? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question where the movies we love growing up really that good. Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, that this is the podcast for you, I am one of your three hosts, Roger Roper, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Gene Sloth Lions. Anyone who spends a significant amount of time with me finds me disagreeable. And each week, we take a look back in time and see if our favorite films from our childhood still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we then break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, the three of us will provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes. Each movie we need to take to get off your butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. This really, uh, that's the way that we help our podcast grow. You can also check out our other podcasts, Shad on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, and Game of Thrones. You can also check me out over at, uh, Show Spoilers, where we're reviewing Mr. Robot, and that's at all the spoilers or realspoilers.com. Now that that's out of the way, Big T, what movie are we doing tonight? So we're doing what was originally scheduled for last week before I called the Audible for Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. It was, 1990 serial killers, uh, and in fourth place was Scream with only 8%, Natural Born Killers with 10, Silence of the Lambs with 33%, and the winner in a landslide was 7 from 1995 with almost 50%. Yeah, this movie's, this movie is dynamite. Um, and if, if those who, uh, if you're, if you're too young to remember 7, um, it, it it's a better version of Saw. I think I think Saul totally ripped off this movie. No, I think it's different. We'll we'll, we'll get into it. I, I think there are two different aspects. Whereas Saul shows you the violence, Seven alludes to it. It's more of a police procedural where we're seeing after the fact. Mm-hmm. But uh, in doing the list, I realized afterwards how the hell did I leave off American Psycho? Yeah, American Psycho is better than all four of these movies. But I was really surprised by Natural Born Killers coming in so low with only you know basically ten percent of the vote. Uh, Science of the Lambs, I think, is the strongest of this of this field. And I went into seven remembering it was great, uh, like you, Raj, but I have a very different takeaway after watching it a second time. Two things. American Psycho came out, like, I think in 2000 or 2001. Oh, is that why? Yeah, that's why. <laughs> Wait. I thought in bringing it up, you knew that it came out no, in the 90s. No, no. Uh, oh, uh, hold on. I make the list, and I must have thought of it. It was 2000. So it was filmed. It was 2000. Uh, here's what it is. It w- it's set in 1987. That's See, right. That's, the, that's, that's right. That's what it felt like Susu Studio. I believe in taking care of myself between a balanced diet and a rigorous exercise routine. In the morning, my face is a little puffy. I'll put on a <laughs> face mask while doing my stomach crunches. I could do over a thousand now. <laughs> Taken directly from Roger's Tinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also, second thing, I'm a little under the weather. So I apologize. Um, if, if I sound a little off, uh, or I go a little crazy, I'm on uh, a, a cocktail of, uh, soda water, ramen noodles, and mucinex. So. What was it? A couple late nights of destiny? Got your, <laughs> no. got your, your immune system <laughs> run down? No, I know. Um, my dad got sick when he was out here and I don't know. It's, we went to Jerome. <laughs> People get sick in Jerome. I don't know. Anyway, seven is for, the, for those of you for the ninety nine percent of the audience who doesn't know where the hell Jerome is. Jerome is a a mining ghost town uh, in northern Arizona in the mountains, and it is uh, very very haunted. And also, you get sick there. Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. Well, seven is a nineteen ninety five American neo noir crime thriller directed by David Fincher and, and written by Andrew Kevin Walker. It stars Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Gwyneth Paltrow, John C. McGinley, R. Lee Ermey. And Kevin Spacey. It tells the story of David Mills, played by Brad Pitt. He's a detective who partners with the retiring William Somerset, played by Morgan Freeman, to track down a serial killer, played by Kevin Spacey, 
who uses the seven deadly sins as a motif and as murderers. And uh, Big D wanted me to make sure everyone knew that it won uh, not an Oscar, but it, but it did win something. It won the best movie at the 1996 TV Movie Awards on MTV. It can't be a TV Movie Awards. M- you mean oh, fuck. MTV Movie Awards. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try that. It won a Spaceman. <laughs> Yes, it, yes, it won, it won a space. A moon man. man. Are they moon yeah. men? They're moon men. Uh, we always ask the question, where were you, uh, when you first, uh, saw this movie? Uh, Big D, we'll start with you. Well, I can remember it was in college. The student, this is before again, DVDs were really readily available. You couldn't stream. So in college, the university every Saturday and Sunday would have like a, a new run movie that they would do in the student union. Where you could pay like a buck and everybody yeah. would go. Yeah. Usually, usually we'd get really high before we'd go drink in the theater. Uh, we went a group of us to see this and I don't think being high and drunk at the, at the original time I saw it helped it, but it stuck with me and, uh, watching it today, I have great memories of hanging out there in college. Yeah. This was for me. This was another Chili's, uh, and, and movie night out at uh, Pleasure Island uh, in Orlando, Florida with my high school girlfriend. Um, this is, uh, it, for fans of the podcast, it was, uh, we go to Chili's, we'd, we'd split the queso, we go to the movie, and then we go back to my house and have disappointing sex. Um, I was mesmerized by this movie and I'm surprised I even got laid because this movie was very disturbing. Uh, but somehow, uh, I don't know. It was high school. You were horny all the time. I was just, you know, this movie has a very graphic sex scene in it. For some reason, I was still able to, uh, to, to have sexy times after, after this. But, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what I remember, uh, the first time I watched it. But I, I remember when I first got my DVD player, this was one of the first movies I bought because I wanted it to be in my collection. I'm obsessed with this movie. As, as much as I'm almost uh, obsessed with American Psycho and the Saw movies, guys, I think I have a problem. Yes. I mean, I think you have many problems, but right, yeah. I think this, this is, a, this is a big one. Uh, but it's not uncommon to be able to, to bone after a horrifying movie when you're a teenager. I think the first time a movie affected my ability, uh, to get busy, I mean, there was the prom night, uh, Shawshank Redemption, mm-hmm. but I wasn't planning on getting laid that night. But I did, uh, have a woman over once and made the mistake of watching Requiem for a Dream, and I just could not. Like, I wanted nothing to do with anybody for a couple weeks. Uh, I first saw Seven when I was, 15 years old, I was thinking back on it and I thought, you know, I was so intrigued by the biblical references, the literary references, the, the dark ambiance of the movie. I was fascinated with it. I considered it a thrill at the time. And just thinking back and I was like, wait a minute, I was 15 years old. Like, why was my mom letting me watch this at 15 years old? And it's weird now because I have, like, now I have a nephew who's 13 and yeah. a niece who's 18. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, holy shit, I would not want my nephew watching this at, at his age. Uh, this, this will fuck a kid up as I think Raj demonstrated. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did you watch it with her or she just knew you were watching it? No, she knew I was watching. I mean, I watched it at home. Like she was present, you know. Well, that's weird. I don't think she watched it with me. Big D, you were, you were a blockbuster employee for a while. W- would you, would you adhere to the MPAA, uh, ratings or would you just let anyone rent a movie? Shit, I don't remember. That's a good question. Yeah, knowing the way I was back then, I would probably just let anybody rent. If you looked 18, yeah, I'd let you take it. <laughs> so the, there's no like computer that stops you from doing that? Like it doesn't say this person's not old enough? Oh, I remember it now. I remember it now. I remember. In the computer, like you could tell if the parents were a pain in the ass. If the parents went through the effort of putting in there like, do not rent to my son. He is 13. Then you knew don't do it. But if the parents didn't take the step to make the note, eh, you just let it roll. Were there do not rent lists at Blockbuster? Oh, sure, sure. 100%. So, so someone would come in and, and put yes. down a movie and if, and like what the computer would show, do not rent to this person? No, it could say, do not believe my son. He is not 18. He will tell you he is 18. He is 15. Yeah, the parents could come in and put whatever note they wanted. <laughs> Seems a lot of, like a lot of overregulation from a parenting perspective. I'm guessing my mom didn't, uh, didn't put that note down because I was like, my rental history, uh, when I was a kid was like seven, a clockwork orange, like full metal jacket. <laughs> right. I, I watched everything as a kid. Caligula. Yeah. <laughs> well, w- was there ever a weird situation, like with a family member that you watched a movie and ended up leaving a movie or that it got real uncomfortable? Oh yeah. Um, recently actually. So, um, 
who's the who's the actor that was in uh Dark Knight Rises? Um he plays Robin. Um oh. he's got three names. What's his name? Anthony Michael Hall. No, it's not Anthony Michael <laughs> Hall. Oh, uh jeez. Joseph Gordon Levitt. Yes. Joseph Gordon Levitt. So Joseph Gordon Levitt came out with like he wrote this movie, he directed oh, this movie. Oh, I know movie. what you're talking about. Where he's it's a like, stud. Where he's like a stud, right? Yeah. Um and I was like, "Oh, hey guy, hey, I was home for like the holidays." And I was like, "Hey, you know, Joseph Gordon Levitt, you guys like him, you know of him." Um, he just came out with this movie. I think it was called like Hot Rod or Hot John or yeah, you know what that, I'm talking that about. That screams parents movie. Yeah, within the f- no, but it was like, but I watched the trailer with them and they were like, okay, cool, we'll watch this. Within the first ten minutes of that movie, he's just railing chicks, naked railing them. Uh, you, you, I guess it's a take on modern dating. I don't know. I was it was real uncomfortable. And you have to – eventually, I think I was the one who stood up and was like, maybe we should turn off this movie because my mom is such that she would not say anything. But, yeah, no. Anytime there's sex on the screen and my parents are in the same room, uh, it's a no-go for me. That, that's the most uncomfortable. We can watch – we can watch serial killers, though. Are you guys talking about Don John? Don John. That's yeah, it. That's it, that's it yeah. Hot stuff. Hot, Hot stuff. stud. I'm like, what is he talking about? Oh, yeah. But he, I've only had it happen once and – and now look, because I looked the movie up, because I don't remember what year it came out. Yeah. When I was eight years old, I somehow convinced my grandmother to take me to a movie called So Fine with Ryan O'Neal. It's a movie about like someone who designs jeans that have no ass, like a no joke. <laughs> and I, it, was, I, it was much easier to make movies in the seventies. Yes, and no, it was eighty one. It came out, yeah. and I remember my grandmother. After the second sex scene, she goes, "This is disgusting," and she took me by the hand and led me out of the theater. Yeah, uh, summers with dad. Dad would take me to all the the R rated movies, like Coming to America with boobs and whatnot. And I'd be like, "Oh, I gotta cover my eyes." He'd be like, "No, son, you keep your hands down. You you watch you watch those nipples." Oh, dad. I uh, j- just as a side note, uh, Raj and I went with his dad on a motorcycle trip last weekend, and uh, and we went out to a restaurant uh, <laughs> called the Roadhouse. It's it's a motorcycle uh, bar. It's not it's a, a motorcycle it, restaurant. It's not a restaurant. There was a woman uh with a tank top and no pants on with fishnets. It's a biker and, bar. And rainbow colored <laughs> panties. It's Ugh. a restaurant. When the bartender asks me, does somebody have a tummy ache and shakes her boobs at me? It's a restaurant. To be fair, you ordered soda water and bitters. You either oh. have a tummy ache or you're 85. No, I, I don't want to, I don't want to eat at a restaurant where people aren't fully clothed. Good luck in Texas. Anyway, Rod Senior, Rod Senior is like basically just walking, watching the women go by and just be like, uh, hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah, of course he made you watch. Yeah. Speaking of making people watch, Big D play the trailer. Do you like what you do for a living? These things you see. You have to wear blinders sometimes. Most times. Detective William Somerset is looking for a way out. You're retiring. Six more days and you're all the way gone. So how long have you lived here? Too long. Detective David Mills is looking for a way in. We'll be spending every waking hour together from now until the time I leave. I'll show you who your friends and enemies are. Look, I'm going to come inside five years. Not here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a homicide. They're caught in a game. No fingerprints. No witnesses of any kind. Nope. About the only thing we know about that guy right now is he's totally insane. Where the price of sin is death. There are seven deadly sins. Gluttony. You're going to come take a look at this. Greed. No one touches anything. Sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy. Seven. You can expect five more of these. Body was found on Tuesday morning. I hate this city. We're going to get who did this. This will be the very definition of swift justice. There are two more bodies, two more victims. This guy is methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. He's laughing at us. (laughs) He had a gun. He's two murders away from completing his masterpiece. Ah! 
Let's finish it. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Gwyneth Paltrow. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. Seven. Soon to be retired detectives, William Somerset is partnered with short tempered but idealistic David Mills, who has recently moved into the city with his wife Tracy. Tracy confides to Somerset that she is pregnant and is yet to tell Mills as she is unhappy with the city and feels it has no place to raise a child. Somerset sympathizes having had similar situation with his ex girlfriend many years earlier and advises her to tell Mills only if she plans to keep the child. Okay, so last week I, I tried to say let's Try to remember when we didn't know the ending with planes, trains, and automobiles. Don't let it affect you. So, Gene, I know you weren't a big fan of it this time through. Do you think that had to do with the fact that you knew the end, who the killer was? I think it had a huge thing to do with the fact that I knew at the end uh, who the killer was. That that was disappointing. But, but moreover, and I think we'll get into this, is that w- when the opening credits started – I was right in the mood. I felt really great about it. But the scene preceding that, this is one of those movies that has a brief scene before the opening credits. And I felt like everything just felt really stale to me. Did you guys get that impression that it just kind of the, the dialogue felt a little forced? No, 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 no. absolutely not. No, I, I felt – see, David Fincher is one of my favorite directors. And I feel like he effectively sets up the characters without having to do a lot of exposition. Like – the first introduction of Somerset's character, he's laid out his jacket. Um, it's, it's very clear that he's a very, um, regimented individual. You look at Brad Pitt's character. He's got a little stubble on his shirts, always wrinkled. You know, he's kind of a fly by his seats and Somerset on the, on the other hand is very neat and tidy and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I, I didn't find a stale at all. I loved the beginning of the movie. And I appreciate the attention to detail, uh, from a visual perspective that the, the, the movie's beautifully shot. There's a, a lot of attention to just little, little things. But I guess for me, it was the overall writing of it is that, uh, you know, I, I felt like, uh, that opening dialogue just wasn't promising. Like it wasn't Predator 2, Bill Paxton bad, but it isn't great. It doesn't feel like real detective talk. Like if you watch something like The Wire, which even that is a little inflated, you know, the police don't really talk like that. So when Brad Pitt's t- walking around talking about kicking each other in the balls and like I wasn't guarding Taco Bell, it feels like that 90s overhyped, like just just too much. And I wish they would have dialed it back just a little bit. And like you said, Raj, just let the the visual cues do the talking. I, I didn't have an issue with it. I think it seemed like a believable relationship that was just starting. You have a guy who's disillusioned and getting out of the force, a young guy who's trying to make a name for himself, move into a new city and prove that he shouldn't be out like canvassing the area and the neighbors. So I was cool with it. But that title sequence, man, mm-hmm. I, I, I thought you don't see John Doe until the very end. So you need a way to really instill some of that fear and let us know something about him. And then flipping through those books as, as, you know, John Doe, Kevin Spacey, as we get to see later, you know, stitching together pages, cutting and clipping and just that madness. They really made all of those books. They had John Sable spend 15 grand making all of those books. They weren't just staged. They were all complete with just. The madness written under the pages. And I thought the beginning with the, with the font, the handwritten font they used, it did a great job to let us know John Doe was to be feared even without us seeing him. Who's, who's John Sable? John Sable's a designer that uh, was hired by David Fincher. Oh, okay. Got it. One of the things that I, I really enjoyed about it, I mean, we talked a lot about what you see in the opening credits, but also musically, um, I, as I'm listening to like the, I'm watching the credits, I go, God, the entire opening credit scene has a big feel of Nine Inch Nails' is Closer video. And then as I'm listening to the song, I go, holy shit, like I, I pause it, I go and do research, which I, I felt stupid about later because at the end it actually plays Trent Reznor's vocals, but you don't realize that going through the whole thing, you're like, God, this has some undertones of Closer, which is really a perfect song. Uh, for the opening credits, I was a little pissed that they hit us over the head with it at the end by actually using the Reznor vocals. What if they just left those out? But, uh, but there is a, you know, a, a fairly strong, uh, soundtrack throughout the movie. And I thought that it was a, it was a perfect choice for an opening song, not using the actual audio from Closer, but doing a, a remix of it. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. You weren't a fan of the opening sequence and that wasn't the original plan that Fincher had. They shot a scene where Somerset is out looking at like a farmhouse in a rural setting where he's going to move once he retires and he's riding the train back into the city. Uh, that's when the title sequence comes in kind of establishing 
you know, what Somerset wants to do. But they purposely, because at this point, Kevin Spacey, he had done the usual suspects. He was a known commodity. And if you saw Kevin Spacey's name in the title sequence or anywhere in the advertisement, you'd kind of question, where is he? I haven't seen him. They purposely left him off all the opening credits, all the promotion, so that when he's revealed in the end, uh, it's a surprise to all of us. And I think it worked. Yeah, I'm glad they cut that scene because even though this is a by-the-books police procedural, David Fincher, I think, takes the story in some interesting directions, um, truly because the movie is really about the killer, right? It's really about what his overarching plan is. Um, and as a Catholic, the fact that they bring in the seven deadly sins and all that, it was uh, that's the interesting part of Catholicism, that and the Spanish Inquisition. But I started to pick up on other things like, did you know that it's seven days – yeah. Until Somerset retires. Also the metronome showing how, uh, that's the only way that he can keep order in his, in his life. And when you think about it, Somerset and Kevin Spacey, the killer's character, John Doe, they're kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum with, with Brad Pitt's character somewhere in the middle. No, I think they're both very similar characters. They're both tired. They're both sick of the way people are living their lives, right. but they just are choosing different ways to address it. And right. with the sevens, it's also 7 p.m. is when the box is delivered. Right. Seven is, is, is heavy throughout it. But, you know, as we get into this, you and I are both a big David Fincher fan. He can set the mood. It's gritty. Mm. It's grimy. You can, Love you it. can feel the scenes. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm happy to get into this. Well, Somerset and Mills investigate a set of murders inspired by the seven deadly sins. A man forced to eat until his stomach is ruptured, representing gluttony, and a defense attorney killed after a pound of flesh is taken from him, representing greed. Clues of the murder scenes lead them to a suspect's apartment where they find a third victim, a drug dealer and child molester strapped to a bed, emaciated but alive, representing sloth. Daily photographs of the victim taken over a year show the crimes were planned far in advance. So as a partner, you know, it, if you look at like Lethal Weapon or the movies that have a, a pairing, of cops. They got to be polar opposites. They got to kind of play off of each other. And I think Somerset and Mills are perfect. They're polar opposites. They're the yin and the yang. You know, Mills is young. Somerset's old. One is delusioned with the way people are. One is optimistic and still holds out hope and idealistic. One is reserved. One is emotionally impulsive. Uh, and I think it really works. Some of their best scenes are just sitting in the car, having a conversation. Gene, you hate the dialogue. I think they give us just enough to really, for this movie to have an impact, you got to care about the two cops. And I think within the first 25 minutes, their relationship seems real. And I start to care about both of the players. Yeah. I feel like we watched two different movies because as much as I was impressed by Kevin Spacey's delivery and his lines, I thought that everybody else just, it, it was, it was boring. It dragged after the second murder. I was just like, can we get on with this damn movie? It was talk, talk, talk. Uh, nothing really eye opening. And, and I think that's the key complaint that I have about this movie is that we talk about, you know, this guy's supposed to be a, a religious zealot and a madman, someone who's kind of driven to the brink and, and, and engrossed in this, this mysticism. And in essence, like he doesn't get deep enough. He's going to the library and grabbing like the greatest hits books. And then like, he's not like, I know religious crazies. This guy is not a religious crazy. Like the shit that they're into is way deeper than the seven deadly sins. Like, come on. So, so to me, that really bothers me. And I think the most egregious, <laughs> egregious performance in this movie is by R. Lee Ermey. Now, if, oh. if you don't know who that is, he was the drill sergeant in, uh, in Full Metal Jacket, which I love that performance, but that is all he can do. As a police chief, I felt like he was like reading cue cards. I was just like, get him the fuck off the set immediately, please. I have the complete opposite note written down. <laughs> I thought R. Lee Ermey's made a brilliant appearance. In the movie and played a completely different character that we had ever seen before. I was like, um, where's, where's the yelling? Where's the swearing? You know, where's Raj? For God's sake, you can see him looking off camera to get his lines in oh, the office scene. You're, He's you're, looking you're, off to the crazy. side. What, what do I say next? I, th I thought Arlie Hermy was great. I, I like, I liked his character. In fact, I had forgotten that was Arlie Hermy because he's got his hair. He's got a completely different look. He did have one great, like one shining moment in the movie that I, that I have to admit was good. It's when he picks up the phone and he's like, this is not even my uh, desk. This isn't my desk. Yeah, so That's good. good. That's good. Okay. Here, here's my only problem with this movie. I thought all of the seven deadly sins were twisted enough that it was believable. This guy is not a genius. He obviously has some mental problem because he has like 15 sure. to 25 empty aspirin bottles in his house. So we're not dealing with a genius here. 
But all of the seven murders have to be timed and to fall in sequence in perfect order with a lot of factors that are out of his control. Without okay, some, explain. without Somerset being like a really detailed, amazing detective. He doesn't find the linoleum slivers within the spaghetti and go back to the uh, house and match them to the floor and move the fridge. If they get some normal detective on that first gluttony scene who doesn't care, who just says it's some big fat guy dead, the rest of them don't fall in line. He can't go back and restart it. So he got lucky that he got Somerset, who was really going to go above and beyond. That actually would have made a perfect, like, anti-Pink Panther movie where they're just a, a criminal constantly trying to leave clues and be yes. like, fuck, they didn't get it. All right. <laughs> trying to get It's Kevin Spacey just trying to leave evidence everywhere. And nobody finds it. That I would watch. He's got to go back and put post-it notes on the fridge. Because, look, if he doesn't find the floor scratches and move it, then he doesn't find the fingerprints. Then it doesn't sit the time so they find sloth at a year. It's it's all completely out of whack. And there's a lot of things that are out of his control that make this plan problematic. Okay, so are we talking about the plan? I We're jumping ahead, but are we talking about the – all right. We have to imagine that at the end, when he becomes Envy, you have to assume that was his grand plan. Right. That was his – right. But was was Mill's wife – part of that equation oh, we're not going way ahead you're going way ahead well yeah, i just, just said I mean, we are we just said we are and then you jumped you jumped, just you jumped to the very end let's wait I'm just say because i think that's a good question right, guys are we are we all gonna pay this prostitute guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right but all right so we're, we're talking about the little the, the details the tightness of the script when they find sloth uh no matter how many times i've seen this movie by the way john c McGin- mcginley bald head does not look like john c mcginley plays the SWAT team leader, fantastic. When they bust in and they find the guy on the bed, it still gets me every single time when he like, when he wakes up and he's going, ha, 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 like that, that's an animatronic, but that, no, it's see, that's not the brilliant. No, it's not. Yeah. That's a, that's a real, that's, that's a real person. That is not a real person. I, I tell you right now, I watched the behind the scenes. It was a, did you yes, really, you can, that is a real person. Yes, You can see that if you, if you pause it, the dude has three arms. The prosthetic arm with the IV, you they can accidentally uh, see his left arm in the shot. Oh, really? Yeah, that's a re- I thought that's that, a really right, skinny so, guy. So we'll say this: uh, kudos for uh, practical effects versus CGI, because that guy fucking scares me. Yeah, there are brilliant details. Uh, the bed sores on that guy, and and the details are are both horrifying and comedic. So th- the one thing I will give this movie is that uh it, it made me laugh in the way that I like to laugh. Now, I don't think it was a a, a Raj, like, yuck, yuck, like, I, I want to watch a show that, that cracks me up. It was a dark laugh. And and little things like uh, the guy that's scraping the name off of Somerset's door, <laughs> and they're like, and he's like, could you please stop doing that? And he just goes, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and he just, and that's it. The, those little things, the, the creaking of the chair, the, the, the attention to every little artifact, from typewriter to clock to portraits, uh, as you mentioned, Big D, the, the journals, nothing in this movie looks like it's a set. Everything looks like it's, like it's perfectly dreary, perfectly weathered. They did an amazing job with like that. Again, you compare that to a movie like, I hate to do this, but, uh, of a similar era, Predator 2, that looked like a movie set. Like yeah. the, 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 the Mayan ruin, uh, apartment <laughs> and everything looked, you know, everything that they burst through looked like cardboard. So this was, uh, so, so kudos to that. Again, visually amazing, not so crazy about the storyline and, and the dialogue itself. Yeah. Everything in this, in this movie looks lived in. It looks like it's aged. When they do that first reveal, when we, yeah, I mean, it's shocking enough when we see gluttony. I hope that was a prosthetic body and not some, 800 pound actor laying on like the, the slab. Cause that was gross. Did you, did you check the behind the scenes? I guess maybe it was an animatronic. I'll have to go check. <laughs> animatronic. But when they, when they pull back, when they discover sloth and the camera pulls back and you see the hundreds of uh, pine tree air fresheners. Yeah. We're there with the cops, like disgusted and the smell and that this oh. dude's alive. But I want to ask. Of all of the, of the deaths, cause not all of them, yeah. you know, lead to death. Which was the worst and which is the one that you would choose if you had to, had to uh, suffer? Which, which is the worst death? Yeah. Which is the, well, which is the worst of the seven deadly sins? Which was the worst punishment? Like, would you rather be oh. force fed until you died? Would you rather have to cut off a pound of flesh? Would you rather have to, 
no, I think sloth has got to be the worst one. No, are you kidding me? I don't want to be anally raped with a, a a knife device. Who said who said it was her anus? No, it's because Raj doesn't have a vagina. Yeah, at least we we exactly. assuming. I don't want to make. I I don't want to identify your gender through this. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I that that would be the worst. I don't want to. I, I nor nor would I want to do that to someone. You know what I mean? But sloth, you would suffer for a full year. You've got tubes in your genitalia. You chew off your own tongue. You go blind. Your t- brain turns yeah. to mush. Your uh-huh. muscles all atrophy. You got bed sure. sores everywhere. Right. You got your hand cut off. Mm-hmm. You know how long it would take to kill somebody while while raping them with a razor strap on? It, minutes. No. Obviously, the death I would like to go out on is envy. I, I'd want to be envy. I'd, I'd want them to see my elaborate plan come to fruition. I want to get the best of everyone, and then I want a single shot to the head. Go right out. Gene? Yeah, envy is a no-brainer. No. But as far as the worst is slow. No, yeah. you would take envy. I would take – Ah, you see, I was going to say the vanity. You would take vanity? Get your face all cut off? No, up? but you would go out with some sleeping pills. You would go, yeah, but the other one, you just get shot. You're still alive. You could actually walk away from that. Yeah, I think that's the one that gives me the best option. I'm like, because they, they can do some really wonderful things today with plastic surgery. Right. But this is 95. I mean, it might even be an improvement. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. But you, you, we, we talked about the brilliance of David Fincher. Do you guys know any other director that can shoot in low light? No. Like, uh, David Fincher? Like all his movies are very dark with a purpose. And it doesn't detract from uh the visuals. In fact, I think it enhances it. Yeah, he uses light. And I, I feel like all of a sudden we're turning into like a real critique podcast. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, the scene where oh, Somerset, the where, where yeah. Mills takes out his flashlight and it's, you know, flickering. And he's looking at the developed photos hanging in the bathroom. <laughs> but, yeah, his shit looks grimy. It looks real in the way that, like, the dark night looked real. Exactly. You, know, so. you can almost smell it. Yes. You can almost smell yeah. Um, and that's very effective directing. Well, the detectives use library records to identify a John Doe and track him to his apartment. Doe flees and Mills gives chase. Doe turns to hold Mills at gunpoint for a moment before escaping. The apartment contains hundreds of notebooks revealing Doe's psychopathy as well as a clue to another murder. Okay, this is where the movie starts to really stink for me. Now, oh. now, Roger, when we watched Point Break and you were talking about like, well, come on. I mean, like, really? Uh, l- let's talk about this. There's a guy who's paying another man's rent for a year, uh-huh. but doesn't buy his own books. He goes to the library for research, like as opposed to just paying cash for books and leaving no no trail there. Yes, yes. This this was 95. This is what people did. They mm-hmm. went to the library there was not a Barnes and Nobles on every corner. Yeah. Actually, probably there was in 95. No. But, uh, but yeah, no, you went to the library. That's what you did. This guy has thousands of notebooks and he doesn't buy his own copies of Paradise Lost of fucking, of, of, of Dante. Like, come on. No, cause they, well, unbeknownst to John Doe, the FBI was illegally tracking library records, uh, unlike at Barnes and Nobles where they track all your sales. Yeah, but you're saying John Doe is going to the library, checking out books, giving his little card. Like, can you see? Does that, of does course. that seem in any way yes. congruous with the character? How, how many how, have you been to a public library yeah. lately? It's it's filled with nothing but psychopaths. God, yeah. Because look, if he wants to really research, a local bookstore isn't going to necessarily have the specialty nutbag books that he was looking for. And he might have actually gone even deeper down the hole, finding dark material that isn't exactly going to be sitting on the shelves at a Barnes and Noble. You might have to order that stuff again, but think about where he lives. Yeah. This is a city yeah, with underground clubs. Yeah. This is a city with, no, there's easily bookstores. You go to a cult bookstores, you get all kinds of bookstores. I think it's bullshit. Uh, and then it's just easier to go to the library. Right. So that, and then, and then beyond that, you got, you know, you've got the great chase scene. Everyone's like, Oh, the chase scene. The chase scene is basically running around in a building for a while. Nobody calls for backup. Again, this movie's supposed to be realistic. Fucking predator two point break. Nobody called for backup. These guys don't call for backup. They're in an apartment building. They're not supposed to be there. Exactly. They're not supposed to be there. Yeah, but there's shots fired. Doesn't matter. They're not supposed to be there. Exactly. I agree with you there. That's why, that's why they don't call back. There's shots fired. The cops call for backup. That's why they don't call backup. They're not supposed to be there. That's why they pay off the homeless lady to give the statement of, of, so that they can be there because 
like, guys, it was a glorious time, 1995. The worst that the government would do in terms of su- surveillance on its citizens was, uh, peeking around library. And not even that, just looking for, for spikes. Can you, can you imagine Somerset in 2017? He'd be amazed by what the government tracks. Well, he definitely wouldn't be going to the library. He'd just be sitting there on Google. That's right. But there's a, there's a huge problem with the case here. Right. All of this evidence is inadmissible. So they got big problems. That, well, the fact that the FBI was collecting that data, illegal, that it led the, first they buy that information, it leads them to John Doe's apartment, then they kick right. in the door without a warrant. You know, Somerset says, we need a reason to kick on this door. Even if they yeah. catch John Doe there, I think there's a huge problem with their case. No, no, no. That's the reason that the homeless lady gave the statement. Oh, you think she's going to hold up under cross-examination? It doesn't matter. It doesn't. It does. It does when you got a high, uh, high yeah. priced lawyer. It absolutely Dude, matters. The high price. He the, killed the high price lawyer. And you don't think he had friends? No. His lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. He's got money. So you don't think he's going to have a good attorney? He's not going to yeah. be having some public I defender. I don't know. That, that, that attorney's trying to cut deals with the police at the end. Yeah. He's, he's no, looking out for his, for his client. If he can afford an attorney, he can afford books. Yeah. But look, I disagree with your, your <laughs> thoughts on the chase there. I kind of felt like I was with Brad Pitt when he's poking around the corners. And I like that a lot of times you left somebody who's being chased. You know, the, the criminal will just kind of keep running. John Doe kept stopping and waiting for Mills to poke his head around and right. take a couple shots. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. That's why I enjoyed the brilliance of this because too often point break, uh, as an example, where they, they're just constantly running through stuff. There's, you know, they, they go through a, a glass, sliding glass door. You know, there's, there's no purpose for it other than, you know, they're in a movie. Whereas in real life, if you're, if you're just in front of a couple people, you're going to pop off a couple shots. And then, uh, I, then at the end, when he has, when John Doe has Brad Pitt's character on the ground, he's held his life in his hands and then it comes back later in the movie. This movie is fantastic. Well, it tells you that he let him live because he had already picked right. him that, that, yes. that he was going to be wrath and he must have picked him when they spotted him on the stairs when he was the photographer. Right. Uh, but you know, during, you said about what you would do in real life, during those scenes when they were filming, Brad Pitt actually slipped and his arm went through the windshield and he severed Ooh. a tendon in his arm down to the bone. So the cast he wears after that fight wasn't just a prop. They had to write it into the script because he really got hurt. Uh, the detectives arrived too late to stop a man forced to kill a prostitute by raping her with a bladed strap on representing lust. They are told of a fifth murder. A model whose face has been mutilated by Doe. Mutilated. <laughs> I hate to be mutilated. Uh, mutilated by John <laughs> Doe. She was given the option to call for help and be disfigured or commit suicide by taking pills, representing pride. Obviously, she chose to take the pills. All right. This is going to get deeper into, into Gene's twisted mind, okay? <laughs> uh, let's talk about raping somebody with a razor strap on instead of getting killed yourself. Illegal. You are going to prison for this, and here's why. It is illegal to commit a crime to prevent a lesser crime. This would be something like the effect of uh if uh if I saw some guy committing petty theft and and I, and I just shot him. Like I murdered him for taking a uh, a a dollar out of a of a out of a donation jar, okay? You can't you can't do that's, that. Hmm. That's Texas justice. This is a bad example. W- what if I held so, a gun to your head and made on, you rob so, a bank? That's it right. is not – no, robbing a bank is a lesser crime than killing. No, what, That's okay. What if you're forced to go into and hold up a bank with a bomb strapped on you? <laughs> Again, you're, you that you have a defense there. It's, it depends on the severity of the crime. So in oh. this case, mm-hmm. you have yeah. no case. If you killed somebody to avoid the potential death of yourself – and that person was not attacking you. There were another innocent person. This is indefensible. Well, they should be locking this guy up forever. He, listen to me. He's going away to either a mental institution or jail. Right. Yeah. He wasn't thinking about, will I get charged with this? He is fucking ruined. He's devastated. Yeah, he's ruined. So even, he right. did it to survive, but he's not really going to survive. Right. That hyperventilating, that <laughs> get this off me, get this off me. That, that actor, I, I don't know his name. That was yeah. terrifying. I felt for him like he wished he had been the one who was dead. Yeah, the brilliance of John Doe's plan here is I think that guy's character 
is a pervert. Like he goes to these underground sex clubs. So he was identified by John Doe to be his victim to go in there and do that. And he knows that he's going to be going to jail. John Doe isn't expecting this guy to get off <laughs> in more ways than one. But like uh he's not expecting him to uh, escape prison time yeah. or be put away. Like he he wanted it. He wanted him to be caught by the police. Okay, okay, rewind it rewind it a second though. Okay, so you you're you're chasing this John Doe. Mm-hmm. Right. He's killing people, right? Sure. You get to you get to lust. Uh-huh. There's a guy there mm-hmm. with a strap on mm-hmm. and a dead body. Yeah. And you're not thinking this might be John Doe. Yeah, it's potentially. That's why you take him in, you interrogate him. Yeah, of course. But look at the reaction. But they're just like, but look at I the know, reaction. But they're just like, eh, look at the reaction. What are you fucking psychic? No, this is your prime suspect now. I think they had, oh, they didn't have video, right? No, hold on, hold, hold on, Gene, no. again. They have the, the employee at Wild Bill's Leather who met John Doe. They have him in the right. other interrogation room as the, right. as lust, as the, you know, the, the strap on wearer. He would say, is this the guy who bought the strap on? And the, the owner of Wild Bill would say, no, no, it's not. It's, it's the owner of the sex club in the other word. But still, he could have identified. Him. Yeah. So anyway, re- regardless of all that, you guys, now you guys are beyond the legal argument here. If somebody puts a gun in my mouth and they're like, rape this person to death with a, ra- who the fuck is going to do that? Uh, like really, I'm appealing to natural human nature. I think everybody's going to be like, F- fuck that. Uh, like, you got to either shoot me or I'm going to fight you. Who's going to, who even knows how to do that? That's something you just do. I think you, you improvise. Here's the crazy thing. Wild, wild, <laughs> wild Bill, wild Bill said that's not the craziest thing he's, uh, he's made. Yeah. Gene, I gotta, I gotta defer to you here. Cause I've never been into like a wild yeah. bill type establishment. Uh, yeah. Have you been to some place like wild bill and uh, to shop or browse and how authentic is this place? Yeah. Uh, totally authentic. And that's not, that's not even remotely the weirdest thing I've ever seen, but I mean, I mean, I wait. So tell us. Well, I mean, like, have you ever been to like a like a suspension show, like a hook suspension show? It's a hook suspension show. Is that a is hook that, suspension? Is that show. where people have the hooks in their skin? Yeah, and then they're then they're like elevated uh, off the floor. Right. Right. For what purpose are they? Um, it's exhilarating for them, and 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 the the practitioner considers it art because they're suspending a person by hooks without tearing through their their flesh. Is it sexual in nature in terms of like, are they jerking off the guy if he's being suspended? No, no, but they do, but there are now they do, uh, suspension, uh, embraces basically where it'll be a couple. Uh huh. And they'll actually be suspended together, like in a, Ooh. in a, like in a intimate, in an intimate, it's not, it's not, they're not having sex, but they're in an intimate position. No one's getting milked. Um, well, have you, yeah, no, but I'm, go ahead. I'm wondering about, like you said, that that's not the strangest thing. Like, it, would they normally make, a dildo with a knife on it. Is that something where even Wild Bill would be like, eh, what could you be using this for? Yeah, they would, but it's normally just as a, like as a, as an art piece. It's not going to be used sexually. Piece? Yeah. It's, it's more like a, you know, a wow. And a lot of times, uh, for art, for people who make, uh, leather goods, vinyl, uh, uh latex and stuff, you want to have that big crazy thing and nobody's even going to buy it. You know, you, 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 you price it at some exorbitant amount, $30,000. But when you go to trade shows or when you have your shop, you have it there and it's a conversation piece. People are like, wow, he can make that. What other cool shit can he make? So this is not, I mean, I would not, uh, consider this a very odd piece. Like it's, you know, it's actually, and it looks pretty cool. I mean, aside from the fact that it was used horribly. Um, well, have you ever been to like a sex, uh, uh underground sex club? An underground sex club. Like an underground sex club. Like where this guy is at. Like a bathhouse? Ah, uh, could be a bathhouse. I mean, I've been to like, like swinger parties, but I've never been to like, uh, I've never been to like, I don't think I've done a bathhouse before. I, I went to the red light district in Amsterdam. Right. It wasn't, but that was more out in the open and uh, kind of like a, a family environment, surprisingly. Yeah. No, I, I felt the same way when I went to, uh, the red light district in Amsterdam. It's very safe. Very nice. Yeah, you would see fathers and sons, mm-hmm. couples, but I would never go into that that whatever that establishment was Ugh. where God. lust happened. That that just looked like you would get like herpes from just like touching the door handle. Well, apparently she did have herpes, and that's why John Doe wanted her dead. Well, as Somerset Mills returned to the police station, Doe turns himself in covered in blood. He has been removing the skin on his fingers to avoid leaving prints. The blood is from an unidentified victim. Doe offers to take the detectives to the two final victims and confess to the murders, but only under specific terms or he will plead insanity. Somerset is wary, but Mills agrees. 
Okay, the insanity plea is perhaps the weakest threat I've ever heard in a in a movie. Insanity plea almost never works, first of all. Secondly, the meticulous nature of the crimes would make it almost impossible to get the, the insanity uh, uh, plea uh, to work. I, I don't think that's really what it was. I think Somerset and Mills and the captain realize their case is predicated upon a couple of illegal actions that his defense attorney seems like he's fairly competent. Once he finds out that, you know, they acquired the information to get them to actually identify him, you're going to get half the evidence thrown out. I'm wondering if Somerset and Mills reluctantly agree so that all of this never goes to court because they're fucked as detectives. I think that's a, that's a sound argument. I don't know. Have you guys heard of the, the Robert Garrow case? No. Nope. From 74. Um, what's the Robert Garrow case? So Robert Garrow, uh, it was the case of the buried bodies. It's really interesting. It's, it's very closely related to this. So there was this guy, Robert Garrow, who was a, a serial killer. And, um, he told his lawyers that there were two other bodies and he told them exactly where they were. Um, one was in a mine shaft and I forget what the other one was. And the lawyers knew, but they were under attorney client privilege. They, they were, they were sworn not to, to divulge that information. And so what they did was they really desperately wanted to tell somebody like they had to get this information out, but they couldn't betray their client. And so what they tried to do was go to the prosecution and say, Hey, let's, let's negotiate a deal here. We're not going to, he's going to go to prison. That's for sure. But maybe if we can negotiate a little bit of a deal, work something out for him, then we'll tell you where the other two bodies are. We know where they are. And the prosecution said, nah, no deal. They wouldn't take the deal. Yeah. But there's other cases where family members can get involved and if they just want to recover the remains and to finally have closure, where I've seen cases of kidnappings where they will allow it. So I think it's flexible. It's up to the DA. Uh, but I would want to, as a family member, if you have the serial killer caught, you want closure. I would be okay with them doing it. But as the police department, they're one follow their trail helicopter and they're one other car. At any point, they could have ambushed Mills and Somerset. And help John Doe escape. Absolutely. The van coming in, that could have been six dudes with, with automatic weapons. Yeah. You, you also have that little like RV shack out there. How do you know? Or it could have been like Red Dawn where you had them laying in a pit ready to pop up. Anything could have happened. <laughs> Fuck all that. The, there could have been a bomb in the box. Yes. Done. Exactly. Well, the detectives follow Doe's directions to a remote desert location within minutes. A delivery van approaches. Mills holds Doe at gunpoint while Somerset intercepts a driver who has been instructed to bring a box to him at 7 p.m. Doe taunts Mills by telling him how jealous he was of his life and Tracy. Somerset opens the box and warns Mills to stay back. Doe states that he killed Tracy, representing envy. He also states that her, that her head is in the box and that she was pregnant. Despite Somerset's warnings, Mills shoots Doe, completing Doe's last murder, representing wrath. Police converge and take a devastated Mills away. So, as I mentioned before, Kevin Spacey's performance at the end, it is flawless. Yeah. When he's in the back of the, of the car, uh, he cycles through smugness, anger, contemplation, resignation. He's just putting on a goddamn clinic. Like, it doesn't get better than that scene, especially the way it's shot through that, through that fencing, uh, between the front and the back of the vehicle. Gorgeous. Yeah. Did you also talk about shots? In the end, the reveal where John Doe is on his knees and Somerset finally sees the head in the box and turns. Kevin Spacey is looking up kind of proud with the sun behind his head and it creates this almost like a halo effect. Like this is the pinnacle of his, of his year long plans and it looks beautiful as disturbing as it is. Yeah. So my question is, why doesn't Morgan Freeman's character wait for the van to arrive? Why, why does he leave the situation? Because you don't know if there's somebody he's trying to separate the van and whoever's in it from John Doe. So you go engage the van, try to see what's in it. Okay. If there is a bomb or there is, you know, they take Somerset hostage, at least Mills is back with John Doe and still has him protected. And it was smart. You do it in the high tension power line so the helicopter can't land easily. Right. You've kind of isolated them. But this, this final scene here, you mentioned Kevin Spacey's performance. It sticks with you. It has to be one of the best kind of twist reveals at the end of a movie. I can't remember of anything, I think maybe the sixth cent that, that compares to the shock that we almost have felt when he first opens the box and we realize what's in it. To be fair, I didn't really even like Gwyneth Paltrow's character in this movie. So like, I really wasn't that upset by it. She just seemed very whiny, but, 
but yeah, no, the, 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 the culmination of, uh, of, of the entire plan is kind of like what did it for me. Like, you know how, like, uh, you, how you, like you said, how you felt at the end of Sixth Sense, uh, when, when her head is in the box and you, you come to the realization that his plan was so masterful, uh, that he, that he played everyone. I just want to, I just want to point out that Raj, uh, has negative feelings toward Tracy, the wife. Yeah. But not, she was cool. but not Mills, the completely dysfunctional husband that doesn't even check on her once a fucking day, that gets upset when she calls him at work, that pays no attention to her, where she's uncomfortable even revealing the fact that she's pregnant to him. If Mills was a decent husband, you would have undone the, the final two murders. He would have called his wife and said, Hey, Tracy, guess what? We broke the case. We caught John Doe. And when she doesn't answer the phone, he goes home. You undo the final two. If he was a decent husband. Beyond that, he nearly dies in a police chase. And rather than call his wife and be like, hey, honey, and sees a woman who is brutalized, uh, you know, horrendously. And instead of calling her and being like, I'm coming right home, like we need to be together right now, he goes to the bar with his partner. That's his solution. Yeah. So the original ending was supposed to be Kevin Spacey's character, John Doe, is killed instead of by Brad Pitt. It's Morgan Freeman shoots him, you know, removing the need for Brad Pitt to do it and cheating John Doe of that final wrath uh-huh. and cheating him of it. And both Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman said, if you change the ending from what we originally shot and agreed to do, we will not promote the film. So they, you know, reluctantly, the studio said it's too dark. There's no way people are going to like it. If you change the ending in here, I don't think the movie holds up to that. I'm still confused by the fact, though, that I get Brad Pitt killing Kevin Spacey as wrath, but the envy part doesn't work for me because Tracy is paying the price for envy, but she wasn't envious. So how the hell does that work in his head? No, he he was envy. Yes. John Doe was envy. That's why he dies. Yeah. So why did she die? She wasn't wrathful. She she was just the victim. Yes. She was needed to right. set the final two murders in play. She yeah. was an innocent bystander. Right. But to your point, like, I don't understand why John Doe's plan wouldn't go, uh, wouldn't go all the way through the way he had planned it if Morgan Freeman's character shoots him. Because wouldn't Morgan Freeman's character be wrath? No, he would be killing him actually as a, an act of, of kindness Justice. to save yeah. Brad Pitt from having to uh, do it I and cheating saying. John Doe. Okay. All right. That would have been weak. Yeah, well, I agree it would have been weak sauce, but no, I definitely like, I definitely like this ending. What do you think happens to Brad Pitt's character? What happens to Mills? Is, is he in jail? I, I gotta believe. Oh yeah. He goes to jail. I, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know. Cause it, it, usually if it's an act of, of emotion, like if you immediately act and it wasn't any kind of planning, I think that he can get off. I really do. A police officer, a serial killer, the situation of his wife's head. I don't see a jury is going to, you know, convict him. Yeah. But I got to ask you guys. I know Roger doesn't love many people. He loves his dogs. But if you were put in that similar situation where the the person you love the most had just been murdered, do you kill that person and in some small way give them the satisfaction or do you have the restraint to arrest them? Yeah, regardless of how much I love a person, the the second Morgan Freeman, the, the second that Somerset says, if you kill him, he wins, that clarifies and crystallizes the situation for me. No, you don't kill him because you do not fucking give him the satisfaction. You want to see him rot in a cell. Oh, God, I think I think I'd have a Brad Pitt situation. I'd have the, uh, oh, God. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then the gun. Is that an orgasm? What? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, exactly. Did you also pick up on those quick few frames as Brad Pitt is he's, he's trying struggling. to decide what he's going to do? And there's two quick frames of Gwyneth Paltrow. No, no. Yeah, it's it's much like in you know his his next movie, like Fight Club. Yes, where as he's looking down, it flashes where she's laying in bed looking at him. Two or three frames. He immediately sits up with resolve, goes and puts the gun to his head and shoots him. I'm right there with him. The second that yeah. I knew my wife was dead with our unborn child, I would have gone a step further. I would have left nothing of him. I would have ravaged him like an animal. I would have ripped his head off his body. I was thinking as this was going on, I wouldn't have stopped. Yeah. They would have had to pull me off. There would have been nothing left of him. Well, he unloaded his clip onto him after he kills him. He oh. unloads the clip. Oh, I'm, stomp- I'm stomping his head to mush. I would have been much like Brad Pitt at the end. They're a zombie, a shell of myself. Well, the, the box and the what's in the box, I mean, that's, that's part of pop culture now. 
I mean, even even people who've never seen it. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow even dressed up as. Yeah, I saw. Did that. you see that? She dressed up as what, yeah. what's in the box this this Halloween. I thought that was pretty good. But I think they should have ended it right there with John McGinley's character saying, "Oh my God, call someone, somebody call Holy Christ, fucking call it someone, anyone, and just end it." Yeah, that that was the original right. ending where it was supposed to be up to us. I didn't need the scene of, of Mills getting put in the, right. in the squad car and, and them saying, Oh, we'll take care of him. Do what you want. If, if you ended it on call somebody Christ and it cuts the black. Yeah. I think it would have even ripped our heart out even more than it did. I agree. But this could have easily become laughable if Brad Pitt's performance doesn't carry that, that torment, that indecision. It could have been comical, but instead it's legendary. Agreed. Agreed. Could you imagine if that if that entire scene was just performed by Keanu Reeves? What what's in the box? <laughs> oh god. Oh god. What's in the box? Or Nicolas Cage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's in the box? What's in the box? Uh well now's the time of the podcast where we break out the chat meters and tell you how many wipes this movie uh would need to take to get off your butts. Uh, if you've never listened to the podcast before, uh, it's a very simple uh scale, five wipes. Or Zero Wipes is a perfect movie, rather. Uh, it's the equivalent of Detective Somerset's apartment. It's clean, tidy, everything has a place. Uh, five Wipes is the equivalent of being force-fed spaghetti and linoleum chippings until you finally burst and are left to rot inside your metro apartment. That being said, Gene, how many wipes do you give this movie? So, guys, I remember Seven being this electrifying thriller. It was a mind-boggling mystery. It had this rich script, this amazing soundtrack. But I was 15. Uh, this is a fine film, but it does not live up to its legend. There are iconic moments. There are some great performances, but it slogs along at times. Like I felt like it didn't need to be two hours long. It wasn't as smart as I recall. As I said before, all the references, all the illusions were very, very, uh, pedestrian. It, I felt like it was a, like a high schooler wrote it. And so, uh, maybe I've just gotten smarter since I watched it the first time. Uh, for me, it's a, it's, it's a better than average movie, but just slightly. I would say 2.5 wipes. Ooh, this is this is payback for planes, trains, and automobiles, isn't it? It's not even the same <laughs> genre. Apples and apples and oranges. Uh, for me, this is a zero white movie, guys. This is a perfect movie. It still holds up to this day. The fact that they intentionally don't tell you what city it's in, um, they don't tell you what year it is, allows the movie to still hold up. Right? It's still like a a a, a point in time. But you could feel like it could be uh, set in modern times. I don't know. It's just, it's just really well done. I love this movie. I love the the characters. I love David Fincher. The only way that they could have made this movie better is uh, had David Fincher's original ending. But for me, it's a zero white movie. Big D. I gotta go somewhere. I think in the middle between you guys. I think I'm gonna go with a point seven five. <laughs> I'm gonna mix it up here. I, I think the setting was great. The imagery is great. Gene, I believe your problems come from the fact that you know the end reveal. Uh, if, if you could unknow that, you would, I think you'd really enjoy the movie like you did that first time. Um, but as strong as the movie is, and I love that, like you said, it's minimalistic. They don't tell us the city, so it's not distracting. It's not about the city. They don't give us any information that we don't need to know. I love the conversations between the characters, whether it's Morgan Freeman and Gwyneth Paltrow in the diner talking about her pregnancy. It seemed genuine. I, I liked it. It looks fantastic. And as strong as the movie is, the end is even stronger. Um, so for that, I liked it as much as I did the original time, even though you know the ending's coming. But it didn't make it any less powerful, emotional. Uh, I think it's as close as we can come. I, I'm eager to see Silence of the Lambs now that we've done this. Because I'm imagining that this is, in my mind right now, slightly better. I agree. In my mind, this is slightly better. Well, with that being said, so it's two and a half, point seven five, and zero. If we add all that up and divide by three, what does that give us, Gene? That is an average score of 1.083 <laughs> repeating wipes. Yeah, all right. So where does that put it on the, uh, the, fi- this is 52, right? 52? This is 52. Yep, so that puts it in the number nine spot. Okay. Right below Ferris Bueller's Day Off ha! and above oh. Coming to America. Oh, that's on you guys. fuckers. That's on you fuckers. What? No, no. that's. No, it's, it's worse than Ferris Bueller. 
No, I think I, this, it's, movie, no, this, movie, this movie is much better. better than Ferris Bueller. Much better than Ferris Bueller. Yeah. But I'm, no, I'm, saying, I'm saying it's on. No, that's it's, on you. No, no, that's on you, you guys. Two and a half that's likes. on you guys for over overrating Ferris Bueller. No, fair. I think I think this Fuck movie you. is this movie is the top. This for me, this is the top three movie we've done. What are the what are the top three movies? Uh, they're all perfect. Pulp Fiction, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Back to the Future. Perfect. Yeah, this is this is this is better than. Okay, so here let me do this. I'll go through the top ten now. All right, top ten. Pulp Fiction, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Back okay. to the Future, uh, all perfect. Yep. Then Terminator Two is a point three. Better than this. Great movie. Fight Club is a point three three. Better than this. Aliens is a point five. Better than this, this. is better than Aliens. Disagree. Okay. Die Hard is a point six seven. Die Hard is better than this. No, this is better than Die Hard. Then Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and now seven. Yeah, so this should be the seventh best movie. This should be number seven. This should be number seven. Fuck it, if they made it a half hour shorter, maybe. Is there any David Fincher movie that you wouldn't give a zero, Raj? Um, no, I even liked uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Oh, God. <laughs> the David Fincher remake. I love that oh, Jesus. one. Jesus. All right. All right, well, uh, we have shout outs this, uh, this week, uh, Gene. Uh, we got so, so many shout outs. <laughs> What's a shout out? Shout outs, uh, Raj, when people come to, uh, support the webs. So, fucking, I don't know. <laughs> I'm so fucking pissed off right now. Right. Um, <clears throat> shout outs, Raj, are when people show their support for the podcast by going to shatthemovies.com, uh, scrolling down until we have a little slide out and filling in their name to hear their name right here on the podcast. It's their little way of saying thank you to us and our little way of saying thank you to them. This week's shout outs go to Danimal, the madman animal Cantu. Uh, he was my favorite wrestler growing up. Walsy, the gardener from UK. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have a gardener from the UK, you want his name to be Walsy. Christopher Lee Bell. Um, uh, yeah, Pass. I've got nothing there. Pass. Wonderful pantsuit from Luoyang, China. Just like everything else is made in China. Serena. Not to be uh, mistaken with Serena. Bjorn Turok. <laughs> Pass. That's a Swede. That's a Swede. That's a Swede. That's right. That is a Swede. Bjorn means bear in Swedish. Oh, does it? Yes. I believe so. And Turok means uh, uh, means um, dinosaur hunter. Yeah. Johnny Wildboar. That's uh, the name of the hot sauce I just got. Uh, Eleazar Benier. Uh, I think they're from, that's an Israeli name, right? I believe it's a so. It's Jared flavor. Yeah. Chaz Korfman. <laughs> Korfman! Lorraine. Um, listen, Lorraine is always on this list. <laughs> Jack Spencer. Uh, not, not to be mistaken with Jack Reacher. Daniel Demuria. Daniel Demuria. Just drop the D. There's no need for it. Just be Daniel Muria. And Rob, or as his wife calls him, her poor judgment. Yep. Oh, that makes, that, makes, shit. that makes a lot of sense. Listen, that's, uh, l- listen, if, uh, his wife isn't careful, her head's going to be in a box. What's in the box? <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's all the shout outs for this week. If you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, please go to shatthemovies.com, scroll down, and when you see the slide, I'll put your name in there. We will read it on next week's podcast. Speaking of next week's podcast. God, I got to tell you, I'm excited about this one, fellas. This was a fan suggestion again back, I, I don't remember, maybe a month or two ago. Best of Morgan Freeman. So we've been doing like, it's hard when we do a movie like seven, that's generally pretty good. Yeah. There's limited things you can say about it, but next week I really think this is going to be a good one. (laughs) It was best of Morgan Freeman in last place was driving Miss Daisy glory in second place, unforgiven in third and the winner, the Prince of Thieves, 1991. Uh, what do you remember about this other than the Brian Adams song? I remember Kevin Costner couldn't keep an accent. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That and there was a witch. The witch scene is the same scene from Willow. I remember going to the dictionary and looking up more. <laughs> it's like, wait, he's, yeah, I, I do, I do black? remember that as well. What's going on? Oh, no, he's here? Moorish. He's Moorish. I just remember the the outfits look really bad. <laughs> that and the moops. What what moops. upsets me about this is any given day. Any given day. You could call me up yeah. and be like, hey, you want to watch Unforgiven? I'll be like, fuck yes. Let's watch the shit out of that. Prince of Thieves? What the hell, people? Oh, come on. This is going to be so much better than Unforgiven. This is going to be a disaster. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree. I agree. It's going to be a disaster. Um, but do you know Sh- Sean Connery makes a cameo in this movie right at the end? He's Richard the Lionheart. 
Oh yeah. Is he a Spaniard? That's right. <laughs> he's not he's he Egyptian. An Egyptian right. Spaniard? Well that concludes. But no, I, I yeah. hold on. I, I believe when we go back and look at this, much like if you look at like Game of Thrones today, the way they, they do the costuming correct. Yeah. And if you go back and look at some of uh, Highlander. Remember Westworld? Willow. Yeah, Highlander. You go back and look at the way Highlander displays the medieval warrior. It looks terrible, like Willow. I think Kevin Costner in tights is just going to be epic. I think it's great. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Chat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere, including Twitter, Zeus, Snapchat, Surge, Daddy Hunt, and Instagram. <laughs> just follow <laughs> At Shat the Movies. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search for Shat the Movies Podcast. Our website is shatthemovies.com where you can vote on upcoming movies. Uh, our email, if you want to suggest some movies, is hosts at shatthemovies.com. We're everywhere. Fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by, please be sure to leave a five-star review that helps the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review where we review, rather, television series such as Westworld, Taboo, and American Gods. Um, oh, and Game of Thrones. You can also check out the information on our website, chatontv.com. On behalf of my co-host, Big D and Gene, the Moors Lions, I'm uh, Roger Roper. Be sure to join us next week for our Prince of Thieves Robin Hood review. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Take care. <laughs> good night and good luck. <laughs> And with a little 